Hello, Gen Chem Lab students. I'm going to help you with the silver solder experiment calculations. This video is a tutorial. Of course, I don't know what your particular data was, so your numbers will be different than mine. But I just want to give you an example of how to do these calculations. We'll start with the gravimetric procedure. So this is a screenshot of the procedure that you followed. Notice that the mass is around one gram, maybe a little bit more or a little bit less, but it should be pretty close to one gram. It's really important that you're using the right um, piece for each part of this experiment and you don't mix them up. So to start our calculation, we need our data from lab, okay? And so at this point, hopefully you set up, I don't know where to put my picture. Okay, there. <laughs> hopefully you set up some kind of a data table in your lab notebook. Um, I have here an example where in the first week I would have collected the mass um, and the second week I'll collect different data for the part one and part two pieces. So I left the title of that, that third column empty. But essentially, this is just one way to organize it. You might find a somewhat different way, and that's okay. Um, for the initial mass, so week one, for the initial piece that was larger, we use that in part one. I'm going to pretend like my measurement was 1.0231 grams, and my week one part two measurement for the small piece, I'll pretend was 0 0.0987 grams. Okay, so that would have been the data you've probably already gathered in lab, or you will very, very soon. In week two, we have two different kinds of data we're gathering. Um, for part one, we're gonna be gathering a amount of AgCl. So silver chloride is the material that you made that's a white powder. So you're going to filter it and then dry it and then weigh it. Okay. So it's going to be another mass. You're going to weigh it on the same balance that you initially used for your solder piece in week one. Um, that mass should be quite a bit smaller in my data, just as an example, I'm going to say that I measured 0.4948 grams. And because there's no heading on this column, I am going to label that as grams. All right, I'll show you what to do later on with this column here, or this cell. Um, but for now, we're going to just continue and do our calculation for gravimetric. Now, importantly, um, you need to have space in your lab notebook to record uh, two other students' data on the gravimetric method. You're gonna need to do that in week two. So you need to have the part one information, both the initial mass and the mass at the end for at least two other students, you have to have three sets of data to do the calculations. So be careful that you gather that, maybe make a spot for that in your notebook before you come to lab so you don't forget. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just show you the calculation for my completely fabricated data. Don't copy this, but it's going to be similar. Use your own actual data. There are different approaches to how to think about these calculations. I'm going to choose to think about this in the similar way to um, the first and second chapter of our textbook. So I'm going to think about this as a percent composition kind of problem. And so essentially, a percent composition means whatever part I'm interested in is the numerator. In this case, I'm interested in silver ion. So silver is Ag, I'm just going to write the symbol there. So the amount of silver in grams divided by 
the amount of silver chloride that you have, all right? So this is percent composition in terms of the textbook, but the part I'm interested in divided by the whole, and then I have to multiply that by 100%. So it's part over whole. We're gonna come back to this concept later on as well for our final calculation, okay? So when I am trying to figure out how much of the silver chloride I measured was actually just the silver, I wanna think about the percent composition. I'm trying to change my ink color and the computer is giving me some troubles. All right, so um, I'm just thinking about this, not from terms of our measurements, but just using the my periodic table. I'm gonna look up the weight of silver and the weight of chloride and use that to find percent composition of silver in silver chloride. And so I'm gonna abbreviate percent comp for percent composition. The mass of silver is 107.868 grams per mole according to my periodic table. And the, I'm gonna use that same number because that is part of the whole AGCL has AG in it, but I also have to add in the weight of the CL. Okay, so that denominator is being added together first, and then I'll do the division, and then I'll multiply by 100%. And so if you do this math, which applies to every sample of AGCL, not just the one you made, but all of them, we find out that 75.263% of AGCL is from the weight of silver. So that's a number that's true for everybody. You should just, you know, everybody can calculate it this way, just like I've done. It doesn't matter if you measured a solder sample or you didn't, okay? That's universal. Now, for the part unique to each person, what we'll do with that 75.263 is utilize it to figure out based on how much AGCL we measured. So in my example, it was 0 0.4948 grams at the very end of week two after you filtered it. What I can do is, is recognizing that my percent composition is 75.263 is I can multiply the total amount of AGCL by the percent composition as a fraction. So I'm gonna write 0.7, oh gosh, hold on. I'm gonna write the correct percentage here. Okay, so 0 0.75263, right? So all I'm doing is taking 75.263 and dividing by that 100. So it's a decimal value, get rid of the percentage. So since you can kind of think of it as it's that much AG for every one AGCL. Okay, that's what a percent composition gives us. So kind of canceling AGCL, and we will be able to figure out that 0 0.3724 grams of my final product were from silver, okay? The rest of it, the rest of the 0.4948 grams is from the weight of chloride that we added in. It doesn't um, apply to the silver solder that we started with. All right, so to figure out um, our percent composition of silver in silver solder, the next step we're gonna take is to, I'm gonna make a little area for myself in red over here on the bottom right. The next step we're gonna take is take the amount that we measured at the end of the gravimetric procedure and converted 
to figure out how much of it is silver. And we're going to divide by the original measurement of solder. So the composition in solder is similar. It's still part over whole. The part is AG, but this time the whole is the entire piece of solder that we started with. And I'm going to... Um, figure out that ratio, and then I'm going to multiply it by 100% to make it a percent composition. And so this is an interesting sig fig discussion to have. The answer is 36.3993%. Now, I say it's interesting because where we round this depends on our data, of course. It always does. And I want to look at, um, I have four significant figures up here, and I have five up here. So that means my numerator should have four significant figures because it was based on 0.4948. And of course, my denominator has five. That means I get to keep four figures. So one, two, three, four. This is a tricky answer to round, so it's a good example to use. If I wanted to round this to the proper significant digits, I would have to do 36.40% because 399 will round to 40. All right, so that zero is a significant zero. The captions got it wrong. It will round to 36.40 here. Yes, like that. Okay, there. So anyway, that's my answer for the percent silver in my sample. You would do the same thing for the two people's data that you record from lab. Okay. Get that information before you leave lab in the second week. Do not wait and depend on somebody to email you information later. Okay. Then the next calculation you're going to do is in order to compare the precision all three of you have in your gravimetric um, answers. Okay, so the formula for our precision analysis is called parts per thousand. So the instructions for the lab tell you to um, look at the common statistical calculations uh, form at the end of your lab manual, and you see this number six is called the relative average precision. That's a parts per thousand calculation. And I know that the pre presentation of this information can be a little confusing for people, so I just wanted to show you. Um, so I would have my own data, which we just figured out was 36.40. And then I would figure out um, two more students' um, answers. I'm going to make some up. We'll say the second person I got data from had an answer of 38.10. And the third one had a value of 33.15, just as an example. Again, use your own numbers, okay? So to figure out a relative average precision, we are going to first average all three of these values. You should show that work. I know it's simple math, but um, I need to see that you did it right, because in the instance that you might do it wrong, um, sometimes I get really confused. And so we'll just average all three of these values by first adding them together and then dividing by the number of points, which is, of course, three. Sig figs apply here as well. Remember that when you add things, it's place value. So the top number ends up being 107.65. And then I'm going to divide by three, which is a counted value. So that means I have five significant figures now. That's a little bit confusing, but it happens because you added together. And when you add together, you have to keep a uh, hundredth place in order to keep your significant figures correct. So five digits from my average would give us 35.88 three 
percent. That's my average. Okay, then I'm going to do this analysis right here for each sample. And so I'll walk you through that. I'm going to change to purple ink so we can differentiate the average calculation from the deviation. So deviation, DEV, deviation number one is going to be the absolute value of reading one. These are all percents minus your average. So remember, absolute value means you take whatever answer you get and you make it positive. Um, so 36.4 minus 35.883. The answer there is 0 0.217%. It's a positive number already, so I don't need to worry about the absolute value thing. M2 would be 38.10% minus that same average. Actually, um, there was an error on this calculator. I'm using an app from my phone, which I probably shouldn't because it typed 36.1 on that first calculation instead of 36.4. Let me correct that first. We get 0 0.517 actually. Okay. Um, 38.10 minus 35.883 is our next value. And the percent difference there is gonna be 2.217. And then last we have 33.15% minus our average. And that's still an absolute value. That one is going to be important because I can see that that is going to be a negative number. And I want to take the absolute value of that. All right, 33.15 minus 35.883 gives us negative 2.733, but actually I'm going to go ahead and write 2.733% because that is the absolute value of that answer, okay? Then I will take all three of these numbers and average those. So we're going to go 0 0.517. Mm, I'm going to actually go to the next page for this. I'm running out of space on this slide, so we'll go to one more page. Let's see here. So we'll do the average of 0 0.517 as our first one, and then 2.217, and our third one was 2.217. 733. So I'll add all three of those together and divide by three. They're all percentages. All right, so our final answer here is going to be well, not final quite yet, but our average deviation here is 1.822. Now, technically, I only have three significant digits, but again, because we're adding all three of these, the place value is what matters. That means that this answer does end up with four. So even though 0.517 only has three, we got to keep track of each mathematical step. Okay, and that is a percentage. So on our formula here, we take the average deviation, which we just figured out, and we divide it by the average reading, which is the 35.883. So our last formula is to take 1.822% divided 
divide it by 35.883%. And then we're gonna multiply this by 1000. This is chosen because it's gonna make the number um, manageable. So if we were looking for a percentage, it would seem like a very tiny number, but that's partly because the concentrations are fairly close together. So we wanna get a good sense of the error by thinking about parts per thousand. A percentage is basically the same thing as a parts per hundred. So we're multiplying by a, a thousand here instead of a hundred. Okay, so our answer is gonna be Fifty point seven seven six is what the calculator says. Okay, we want to talk, think a little bit about the unit here. So, your percentages will cancel, and that leaves just the times a thousand parts. And so, our unit is just going to be labeled as parts per thousand or PPT. Okay. Now let's think about our sig figs. I have four on the top and I have five on the bottom and I've been careful to make sure that's the correct number to carry throughout the whole problem. So then our answer should have four because it's multiplication and we're gonna keep the fewest um, total number. And so I'm gonna round this to 50.78 parts per thousand. That's a pretty high error. Okay, a lot of you are gonna see much lower errors. You should have values that are pretty close together, ideally, okay? The percentages will be pretty close together, not your actual gram measurements. So this would be a pretty high error. And so if I got a value like this, I wanna spend a lot of time in the conclusion thinking about what happened. Did things not precipitate completely? That would be true if the percentages were on the low side, if someone's percentage was on the low side, right? So thinking about our data here, you might say maybe the person who got a 33.5 didn't wait long enough or didn't have complete precipitation, something of that nature. On the other hand, the one that's really high, the 38%, maybe that's contamination, right? Maybe, I don't know, some lead got in there, probably not, but could happen, I suppose. You wanna think about what error is reasonable based on the, the numbers that you come up with, okay? Even if your error is low, probably things like transfer loss are an issue. Um, so that's something to think about. This is analyzing precision. If I wanna think about analyzing the accuracy, I have to know what the real answer is. One way we're going to do that is by looking at the instrumental method. All right, so our instrumental procedure, it's important to understand that when you do this, you're, you're going to be doing some dilutions, and it's important to kind of think about which dilutions you did. Apparently, it's not going to let me change to highlighter. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, there. So our first dilution was in week one. You've already done it. Um, basically, your entire small piece of solder, so it's, oh, sorry, approximately 0.1 gram, that whole small piece got dissolved and diluted carefully to 100 milliliters. All right, so that's the first dilution. You already did it. You're going to come into lab and have a small portion of that dilution in your drawer. Okay, you're gonna take one milliliter of that dilution and dilute it again, all right? How much you dilute it to depends on the size of your original piece. So you're gonna wanna go all the way back to your original data. I made up the value 0 0.0987, okay? So the procedure tells you that for your second dilution, if it's bigger than 0 0.095 grams, you want to dilute it up to 100 milliliters. So that's the case for my experiment here. Okay, so basically, because my piece was 0 0.0987 grams, 
I'm going to take one milliliter of the stuff in my drawer and dilute it again to a total volume of 100.00 milliliters. You're gonna use the same dilution procedure um, that we used for Gatorade, right? So you're gonna use a pipette to measure your one milliliter of what's in a test tube right now. And you're going to pipette it into a 100 milliliter volumetric flask. Do not use your graduated cylinders, okay? You need to use a volumetric flask. Then you're gonna fill it up with DI water only. Okay, don't use tap water, because remember, if any tap water gets into our experiment, it will cause the silver to precipitate. And not only would you get an artificially low value, but also you could damage the instrument because it isn't meant for solids. Okay, so just to make like a picture of what happened, we have this tiny piece of solder. It was around 0.1 gram. Okay, you dissolved it and then diluted it in a volumetric flask that had a volume of 100 milliliters. That is my drawing of a volumetric flask. I know it's not very artistic, <laughs> but they're the ones that are a little bit taller, right? So they're about this big. Um, not anything you have in your drawer. The volumetric flasks live on the side bench in the, in the lab. Okay, so then you're going to take one milliliter of that with a pipette and you're going to put it into another clean 100 milliliter volumetric flask. Okay, um, 100.00. Let's be very careful with our significant figures there. So what you've done is diluted it once in week one and diluted it again week two. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, you're going to, to have to make a graph of your standards that you're going to run on the instrument on week two. Everybody in your group needs to make one standard. So you should have four people in your group. If you don't have enough, then somebody's going to have to make two solutions. I'll tell you that the one milliliter solution is definitely the hardest one to make. So choose whoever is the best at pipetting to do that. The smaller the vo volume of the pipette, the harder it is to make sure your meniscus is in the right spot. So just be like extra careful of that. Um, but you should get a nice linear standardization curve, very, very similar to what you got in the Beer's Law experiment, except there's only going to be four standards on it. Okay. You're going to use the stock bottle. Remember, don't pipette out of the stock bottle and don't put anything back into the stock bottle because other people use it. It's a rule, don't break it, okay? Anyway, so you're gonna make your four standards. When you get home, you're going to use your Excel skills to put make that into a graph. And from that graph, the equation will allow you to take the absorbance of this solution. So you're gonna measure this absorbance and then find out what the concentration of it is, right? So that's from the graph. And remember, we're using those strange units. We're using the micrograms per milliliter, same as we did for Beer's Law, okay? And that's because our standards for the silver solder experiment are also microgram per milliliter. All right, so you're gonna use your standardization curve, the equation of that line, will allow you to convert absorbance, which is plotted on the y-axis, to concentration, which is plotted on the x-axis, okay? Once you have that, I'm gonna call that concentration two because it comes from the second dilution. We need to figure out what concentration one would be. I'm gonna make up totally random numbers. They're not gonna even be close to what you get, most likely. I'm gonna say that my concentration two was 3.51 micrograms per milliliter. Your answer will vary, but the sig figs will actually probably be that same value, right? It'll go to two decimal places at the, at the least. So if my second dilution has a concentration of 3.51 grams, I'm gonna use the dilution equation uh, and this dilution scheme I have drawn out here to, to get it back to the original amount 
All right. So I made a 100 milliliter dilution. So that means my final volume from that second dilution was 100 milliliters. I put in one milliliter of my original dilution. So I can use this equation to figure out what the original concentration was at the end of week one. All right, and so C1 times one milliliter will equal C2, oops, Oh, hold on. Technical difficulties, sorry about that. It doesn't really like me to change to the eraser and I don't know why. All right. We're going to do it this way. So my C1 is a mystery. I don't know what it is. My V1 is 1.00 milliliters. Uh, my C2 I made up, but you're going to get it from a graph, 3.51 micrograms per milliliter. And then my V2 is 100 milliliters. Again, if your piece was really small, your V2 might have been 50. So pay attention to what you actually do in the lab. All right. And so to solve this, I'll plug it into our C1 V1 equals C2 equation, C2, V2. So there's C2, V2 was 100 for me. And so I figure out that my original concentration is what's well, gonna be 351, I think. Let me just double check because it's late and videos are stressful. There we go, yep, 351 micrograms. Per milliliter. So that makes sense because I'm going backwards, right? So it should be more concentrated. If you get an answer from this calculation where the first dilution is less concentrated, something is wrong. Okay. Now our last step is to think about in our dilution scheme, what did we do to make that 100 milliliters um, in our first week? And the answer is we dissolved all of that small piece of solder. So that whole entire flask you made in week one has this concentration. So if it's 351 micrograms per milliliter and I diluted it to 100 milliliters, I can use some basic dimensional analysis here to just cancel milliliters and figure out the total number of micrograms, which is, 35,100 micrograms, okay? That's a bit of an unwieldy number. So of course, I'm gonna convert it to grams. I hope you know this one by now. Oops, that's milligrams. <laughs> I did it wrong. There, I needed micrograms. And that's the beauty of dimensional analysis. Even after all these years, it really helps me not mess stuff up. So micrograms, um, so there's 1 million micrograms in a gram. So I'm gonna write 1 million on the bottom. And so now I can cancel micrograms. I've got 0 0.0351 grams. Yeah, all my sig figs seem to be good so far. That is grams of silver because we didn't precipitate anything. So I don't have to think about the chloride or anything like that for this one. It just gets me directly to the grams of silver that were in it. If we go back to our original solder piece, we can now do a percent composition calculation. And so let's see, I'll do that in green. Maybe I will, there we go. We'll do the last step here in green. I hope your calculations are way more organized than my video. <laughs> so we have 0.0351 grams of silver from our 
uh, first the graph, and then we do the dilution equation, and then we have to do some dimensional analysis to cancel out millimeters and get it into grams. Um, then I want to do the part of silver, and then the whole piece was the solder piece. So my original data was 0.0987. Um, that's the little solder, and I'm going to multiply by 100% again. So in this case, I get 35 point, let's see, sig figs, I have three of them. So 35.5623 is what the computer told me. I'm going to round that to 35.6%. As it turns out, that's actually a really accurate result. I picked those numbers totally randomly, but it turned out to be very close to what the manufacturer says is in solder. I'll tell you, I'll give you a hint. If if your data for either the gravimetric or for the instrumental method, it, it should range between say 25% silver and 45% silver. If it was any more than 45% silver, it wouldn't show us the brassy color. It would be silver colored, you know, like a piece of jewelry. And if it was any less than that, it can't conduct well enough to really do what solder is supposed to do. So again, your range should be 25 to 45%. If you do your calculations and you end up below that or above that, bring them to me and I will help you work through it, okay? If you do the calculations on paper and bring them in, um, I will tell you what percentage the manufacturer says this particular sample of solder was. And then it's easier to write a conclusion because you can compare accuracy. If you don't get the chance to do that, you can still think about accuracy, right? So our answer here is 35.6 and our answer to the original gravimetric method was 35.8. That's two different methods that are surprisingly close together, right? 0.2% difference between the two. That would help support the, hypoth the conclusion, actually, that um, the solder was 35%, 35.7% would be the average of those two, um, silver. And so even if you can't come see me and find out what it really is, at least you can think about the two methods. And if they're as close together as my results happen to be, then it was a pretty accurate experiment. If I got one of them that was very different from the other, I want to make sure to discuss that in my discussion and conclusion section. I want to explain which one I think is the more accurate number and why I think that, and also which one is the more precise number. Okay, I hope this helped you out. Sorry it was a little bit long, um, but I hope that it helps. And as always, come see me if you have some questions.